Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, again, good morning. It is, uh, it is so great uh, to be together, whether digitally or here uh, in person, and to be able to hear again these stories, these stories that have been so formative for us. And as I said earlier, this, uh, this, uh, this story of the transfiguration, so important uh, for us. Such a strange story it is, isn't it? I mean, there are, as we watch Jesus and the things that he does, uh, such strange things. And so we have a hard time sometimes making sense of them. I'm like, why in the world? would So here's Jesus, and all of a sudden he goes up on the mountain with his closest disciples, and he, and he just kind of... he. It becomes so bright, it's like uh, it's like trying to stare into a halogen bulb. You know, so it burns your eyes, and so you divert your eyes, and there's this this Moses and Elijah who are there, the greatest of the lawgivers, and the and the greatest of the prophets are there in deep conversation with him, and the disciples are are terrified. They don't know what to say, and uh, and this cloud then comes over, this cloud of God's glory, and and the voice out of the cloud saying. This is my well-beloved son in whom I'm well-pleased. Uh, listen to him. Well, that's not kind of just your normal, ordinary, everyday kind of thing, right? And, and so making sense of it, you know, what, what sense does this make? What does it all mean is, uh, is, is a good question. Um, it's called the transfiguration. And... Uh, and that's because, I think, because of the, the change that happens to the appearance of Jesus. So all of a sudden, he becomes this brilliantly bright light, and, and, uh, and so all of a sudden, you, you just can't, you can't look directly at him. Uh, it's called the transfiguration because of the change in Jesus, but, but if we look at our theology, at uh, what we know about Jesus, we know that in reality, uh, Jesus wasn't changed at all. So this bright light, this glory that showed from him was something that was within him uh, always. Um, so as the Son of God, the Word of God, he existed from before time, before anything was. And so he always has had this glory. He always has had within him who he was, this glorious part of the Trinity, the triune God, always this brightness, glorious presence. But then in the Incarnation... The tremendous mystery of the incarnation, it becomes, he becomes human flesh, and he looks just like all the rest of us. But he's not really just like all the rest of us. I mean, he is. His, the human part of who he is uh, is just like the rest of us. That's the miracle of the incarnation, but, but he never ceases to be divine. And so there is this glory that never departs from him. And so when he's there with his disciples, he says, these are his closest friends, Psst, I got something to show you. I got a secret to show you. And so then he just kind of lets it out. So it's, it's not a change in who Jesus is. It's just a revealing of who Jesus is. This tremendous glory that's within him and so then we want to ask the question, why? I mean, if Jesus is, if Jesus is, is always has this glory, but inside of him, why would he reveal that? Why would he show that? I mean, when I was in high school, if you had somebody who was kind of strutting his stuff, we would say that he was a show-off. And that wasn't a good thing, right? So why does Jesus do that? Is he just showing off? Oh, I don't think so. I, mean, I think he's revealing who he is uh, for the sake of his disciples and for the sake of those of us who would come after them to be able to hear this story and to be able to see him in our minds and hearts revealed for who he is. Today is Valentine's Day, right? Which, by the way, is Hallmark did not come up with, with Valentine's Day. Do you know there was a St. Valentine's back in the 400s? So we got to reclaim these things, right? 
So there was, there was a St. Nicholas, yeah, and, and around Christmas time, you know, we often forget about him. There was a St. Nicholas at St. Patrick's Day. There really was a St. Patrick, and there really was a St. Valentine, by the way. And, uh, and so, uh, so all of them as people, unique individuals that, that showed God's love for the world. And why did Jesus reveal himself? It was kind of his, his revealing his love for his disciples. Because, because as, you, as you want to know people, you reveal more and more of yourself to them. And so, and so he reveals himself to his disciples out of this love relationship. But not just in order to be able to show who he is, but, but also to recognize that um, that as we see someone who we love reveal themselves to us in a moment of intimacy, um, it changes us. It changes the relationship that we have with them. And all of a sudden, we become different kinds of people because we see this revealing in our minds and all of a sudden, we understand more about that person, more about who they are and what they offer to us. And we become different people because of it. Anytime we see something, it changes us. We become different people because of what we saw. It's true negatively. When I was a kid, um, probably about five years old, uh, we came down to Florida for a vacation. And uh, while we were on vacation, I can remember I was eating a, an ice cream cone. We were out, an ice cream cone. And we were outside, and, uh, and I looked up just in time to see a pedestrian who was in, in the right of way as a you know, the crosswalk uh, get hit by a car uh, that sped through the intersection. And I was five years old. That was, that was a long time ago. But I still, that image is still in my head. And I'll never be able to forget it. I'll never be able to get it out. And it's why people who have seen abuse and when, when you know, traumatic, awful, uh, violent things happen to us or when people say violent things to us, you, know, you can't get them out of your head. And it can change you. And so the need to be able to heal those memories, to be able to have, have other kinds of things that we can see and hear from others that help to overcome the trauma of those things that we've seen. But it still makes me very nervous when you know, my grandkids you know, want to walk across the street or when I see somebody I care for, even here at the church, you know, kids that are out in the parking lot are going across the street. You know, um, it makes you attentive to the things that are going on. So that's true for, for us negatively, but it's also true for us positively that as we see acts of love, as we see healing happen, as we see things happen in our lives and around us, it changes the arc of our behavior, and we become different people. You know, there's a study that was done about patients in hospitals, and, uh, and so this was, they were, they were trying to figure out how can we um, help to heal patients so that they can be, uh, they can be released from the hospital sooner. And they found that hospitals that had rooms in which the patient recovering from surgery was able to look out the window and able to look out on something that was beautiful. So a, a park, trees, a pond, nature, um, that, that those patients um, actually were able to be released from the hospital a day earlier and with less pain medication than patients that either didn't have a window or they were looking out at the roof of another building or something. What we see brings us healing and changes the ways that we, that we think about ourselves. That's why you know, this, this, uh, the social media and the internet is, so, is, is such a challenge for us right now because images are so powerful. Do you know that, uh, do we have readers? People who actually pick up a book, sit down and read it? I'm one of those folks, right? But have you noticed, and studies have said, that uh, it's becoming, even for those of us who are readers, it's becoming more and more difficult to actually focus and read because the, the videos, the, the images are so much more powerful 
So we remember about 90% of what it is that we see, but about 15% about, of what we read. And so this, this need for us to be thinking about the things that we expose ourselves to on the social media, do we expose ourselves to things that are violent and degrading and, and, uh, and objectify other people? Or do we expose ourselves to things that are, that are loving and kind and gentle and that encourage the best side of us so that, we, so that we become those kinds of people? We grow towards and our behavior changes towards what we see. A study of kids in elementary school um, they found that if you, as you exposed kids to uh, videos and pictures of, of healthy food, salads and vegetables, um, as you expose them to more of those things, then when kids went to the dining hall and had the ability to choose what they wanted, they chose more of those things. But of course, the big bucks in the advertising industry isn't, you know, the, aren't the farmers and the healthy food people. It's, it's the cereal makers and the junk food makers and the chip makers and all of the things that we all love. And so because we see that, the advertisers focus on that and it changes our behavior. What we see changes the kinds of things that we think about and the kinds of behaviors that we do. And so then, this question for us of how it is that we can reintroduce Jesus into our thought life, to be able to see him, to see the things that he does, and to allow that to so, uh, to so kind of take up our mind's eye that we go towards that. And we don't even have then to think about our behavior because our behavior changes. It has to do with this discipline of meditation we talk about within Christian spirituality. It sounds so, it sounds so ethereal, kind of meditation, like you're gonna be a, a kind of an Eastern mystic on a mountain or something like that. It? But let's just be clear. You meditate all the time, right? I do. You meditate all the time. You meditate about the next car you want to drive. You meditate about the way that you want to change your house so that it'll be more attractive or better suited for you. You meditate about where you want to go on vacation. And probably after a little bit, you're going to be meditating about what you want to have for lunch today. And so as we then think about, we meditate on those things we allow, we make a choice about the things that get into our brains, then our behavior moves in that direction. So, so since the holidays, um, I had a resolution that I was gonna lose some weight. And, and I did, I lost some, some weight. <laughs> and, uh, and I get these cravings. And, and, uh, and so then uh, my particular craving is chocolate ice cream. I just love chocolate ice cream. I have all kinds of memories of sitting with my sister, uh, watching you know, mysteries on TV with a big bowl of chocolate ice cream and potato chips. It's just so awesome. And I would give anything to go and do that again. It's just so great. Um, so I want to meditate on that. I want to spend a lot of time thinking about chocolate ice cream and potato chips. And I can guarantee you that if I do that, when I go into the grocery store, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in this weak moment, my behavior will arc towards the ice cream center in the frozen food section, and I will have a, a pint of chocolate ice cream before I even realize that I've done it. We become the things that we meditate on. And so then this, this, it's why the reading scripture as a regular part of our day is so important because it, it gives us, our minds are eager, they're looking for things to fix on. And so as we read scripture, as we see images of Jesus, he, he changes us as we look at how it is that he behaves. 
as, he, as we look at how he handled people who, who hurt him or betrayed him, um, it changes the way that we think and the way that we behave as opposed to the social media or even other people that we know. Um, <laughs> yesterday, um, you may know this, some of you, um, I was, it was a very busy day yesterday. And, um, and uh, when, um, while I was sitting there, um, just, uh, well, I guess it was on Friday. Was it on Friday? Um, I was sitting there trying to hurry up and cram and get a bunch of stuff done. And I got an email from, uh, from somebody asking if they could help me. And I said, I, I just kind of ignored it for now because I was trying to get this stuff done. And then I got another email and another email. And, uh, and then I got a phone call from another staff person, and they said, I think your email's been hacked. And, uh, and so I wanted just to ignore it, but all of these responses, you know, how can I help, how can I help, started coming in, and phone calls and text messages. And it was, it was clear I, I needed to do something about this. And, uh, and so I was just really, really angry about having to take the time to do that. And, uh, so I got my, I got our tech guy, we have a wonderful tech guy who came and, and helped to sort out the problem. One of the reasons I want to make sure that I tell this illustration is for us as a church, you will never get an email or a text from me asking for money or asking you to go down someplace to get a gift card and, uh, and send it to wherever. You're never going to get that. If, if I need money from you, I will call you and you'll know it was me. Um, but I just so I had this image in my head of this of this you know, kind of this guy sitting in the dark corner of the basement of his mother's house who is just who's trying to figure out who are the most gullible people who are going to send in money who could get money from and let's turn as a church right it just made me furious and I could I just I had images in my head and they were my hands around his neck and so then, then sitting there, and it was, it was, it was like, all right. So I was working on the sermon, and so it was like, all right. So Jesus, and so it's like Jesus is tapping me on the shoulder, and he says, so let's rethink this whole thing, reframe it all. And it's like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So, um, so what image of Jesus do I have about about how he handled his enemies or somebody who hurt him? And the, the image, my brain kind of scanned, and the image went to Jesus on the cross, right? And what did Jesus say about his enemies on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's like, oh, that was the last thing I wanted to hear. <laughs> and, um, and so it's, okay, all right, all right, so I will, I, I'll say it, I'll say it. I, I forgive him. And, uh, and, uh, and then when you think about a guy, I'm imagining it was a guy, maybe a gal, um, doing something like that, I mean, what, what their life must be like and, and just kind of the, just the emptiness and dryness and that's it's kind of like, all right, so, so then it's like, so I got to pray for this guy. So, so I said a prayer for him. And so then, um, so then I'm looking at all of these emails that are in my box and they need a response, you know, that I've been hacked and, and, uh, and so please disregard. So I started just saying that and then it was like, oh no. So it's like, I've been hacked um, and so sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption. Please pray for, uh, for this person, for this guy who would do something like this. And so then there were all of these emails that went out asking for prayer for this guy. And then these phone calls would be coming in, and these phone calls and emails and texts of people saying, how can I help? How can I help? Because the, you know, they, he said I needed some favor for him. So, so all of these people responding, just kind of this outpouring of care and concern. How can I help? I'll do anything. So, so tell me what, what you need, and, and, I'll, and I'll do it. And I got phone calls. I got phone calls from people I haven't seen in a long time. And uh, we, one of the phone calls I got was from uh, Bob Schneider, who's here, and, uh, and his wife, Gail, and I hadn't gotten a chance to talk with him. You know, his wife went through pretty serious surgery, and, and we didn't know how she was going to be. And so when he called, um, uh, she was there with him. And so I said, so how's Gail doing? 
And he said, she's, it's miraculous. She's recovered from all of this. So we got to have this kind of celebration on the phone about, and these wonderful people who, because of COVID, we haven't seen in a long time. Now, all of a sudden, hearing their voices and just kind of being reunited in some way. And a, 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 an African-American man who, uh, who, because of COVID, really cannot leave his house. He's immuno, immunocompromised. Sending an email to me, asking me how he can help me this outpouring of love. So what is it when the world in darkness kind of reaches out and tries to smack us? What is it that God does in the hearts of the people but just to unleash the power of, of love and the, co the, the community of the saints and the shining of light in a world that can be desperately dark? So take that, devil. You know, it's easy for us, I think, in this world to be, to feel like we're alone and that we're, you know, we're just buried in the negativity and the darkness of the time. It's easy for us to allow that to kind of penetrate into our minds and our hearts and allow us to become dark and jaded. That's not the path of Jesus. He invites us up on the mountain. He says, come here. Psst. I got something I want to show you. And he reveals his glory to us. Not simply because he's trying to show off, but to give us hope, to give us purpose, to give something to fill our minds with strength and energy to be able to know that we're about we're about some, some powerful things that God is trying to do in the lives of people today. We are not only not alone, but we're surrounded by a great host of witnesses that sings his praise and that, that, uh, that continues to do his work day in, day out, all around the world, all around the clock, throughout all of history. So, um, it's Valentine's Day. This opportunity for us to celebrate uh, the, uh, the love of the people who are close to us and be able to give them cards, chocolate, strawberries, whatever, whatever little acts of love. But to remember that all love comes from the Lord of love, flows out from him and his desire to, to help us to live into his light and his love where life is rich and meaningful, beautiful. Amen. So let's stand together and affirm our faith by using the form of the Nicene Creed.